April 27, 2007, on what was an otherwise unremarkable day in Tallinn, Estonia. The lights went out, the internet stopped, and the world would never be the same. The era of cyber warfare had begun. In 2007, the Director of National Intelligence for the United States released an annual survey of threats to the world. Nowhere on that list was any mention of cybersecurity or cyber warfare. By 2008, cyber had made its way on the DNI's threat assessment. By 2013, it became the number one item, a position it's held ever since. But ladies and gentlemen, you may have a question. Why does cyber warfare matter to you? More importantly, how does it affect your everyday life? Well, there is the general, intangible, collective threat that we all face, much like nuclear proliferation or terrorism. But cyber poses a unique set of risks and challenges for you, the average citizen. Now, what is cyber warfare? To understand, we have to look to history to contrast. Since man first wielded weapons, battles were fought in clearly discernible locations, between clearly discernible parties. And by the end, there was a clearly discernible winner and loser. For example, in the Battle of Waterloo, in a field 10 miles south of Brussels, stood Napoleon opposite the Duke of Wellington. And after a protracted day of bloody combat, there stood a victor and a vanquished. In cyber, almost none of these principles hold true. The field of combat is the very same place and resource that we use every day in our lives the internet, in differentiating between actors, attributing conduct, determining who's a red coat, a blue coat, a green coat, a pink coat, an orange coat, it's an almost impossible task. Simply put, demarcating between war and peace is impossible. So your presence in this field of combat makes you an unwitting participant in cyber warfare. And what does that mean? Well, cyber warfare can be anything from a large-scale attack on our critical infrastructure, taking out our power grid, financial institutions, even a nuclear reactor, it can lead to the loss of power across the country, the loss of untold sums of money, and even mass casualty events leading to countless lives lost. But cyber warfare can be less than that. It can be economic espionage, political sabotage, the things we see in our headlines each and every day. But cyber warfare can even get you in your home. Rogue states use malware not for some grand nefarious scheme, but to use your computer's processing power to mine for cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Now, traditionally it fell on the shoulders of government to keep us safe, to protect us, to provide for the common defense. In the nuclear era, brave men and women sat deep in the Cheyenne Mountains, watching, waiting, and defending at NORAD's Missile Defense Command. Without them, Global nuclear catastrophe would have been all but certain. In cyber, the government try as it does, and believe me, it does. They cannot provide for the common defense. They cannot protect you. That responsibility lands squarely on your shoulders. You are the front line of defense in this global era. That is a lofty responsibility. But let's understand what that responsibility means 
and why till now we've been failing at it. It's not a responsibility to man a garrison, and it's not a responsibility to watch a terminal waiting for a missile to pop up. Rather, it's a responsibility to develop a cyber hygiene, an ability to defend yourself and protect yourself from threats. What is a cyber hygiene? Well, how many of you here brush your teeth, wash your hands, take showers? Those are all examples of personal hygiene. But be honest with me. How many of you haven't clicked on a link from a suspicious email? How many of you haven't ignored an update on your computer that you probably should have done? How many of you haven't regularly backed up your data? As good as your personal hygiene might be, your cyber hygiene is just not up to snuff. I'm sure I know what you're thinking right now. China's not coming after my data. Iran's not targeting me. I'm not a target. I am nobody. That could not be further from the truth. That's for two main reasons. One's called the six degrees of separation, and the second is that cyber criminals, bad actors, they are becoming increasingly creative in figuring out how to exploit and benefit off of your unprotected systems. To the first point, the six degrees of separation is a maxim some of you may have heard of. It holds that any two people on Earth, all 7.6 billion of us, can be connected through a maximum, maximum of six relationships. So while your data may not be important, while your systems may not be important, your identity might be. You, as the undefended target, might be the first step in a big chain of events, targeting someone you know, or even someone you don't. Chains can get very long and very complex. And to the second point, bad actors, as we like to call them, they've become incredibly creative, figuring out ways to find profit and benefit off of your undefended, unpatched, unprotected systems. For example, in May of last year, a global ransomware campaign called WannaCry crippled hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of computers. Ransomware, as its name might imply, is a type of malware that encrypts your data, takes it hostage, and tries to ransom it back off to you. Countless people saw this screen locking them, informing them of the ransom demand. Now, who is behind WannaCry? This attack that cost the world billions and billions of dollars. It wasn't a cyber criminal. It was North Korea. A nation state attacked individuals, businesses, and multinational organizations, not for some political motive, not to declare war, to seek financial gain. And there are important lessons to want to cry. Keeping your systems updated, engaging in regular backups. But the real, fundamental lesson that underlied the attack is that the line between public defense and private security is gone. The government could provide no respite, no defense for those affected people, those affected entities. Only those that were prepared to defend themselves were able to avoid the ensuing digital mayhem and carnage. Now, it's important to recognize WannaCry was a global attack, but it still hit home right here on Long Island. A photo studio photographed a wedding on a Sunday afternoon. It was a lovely affair. Went back to the studio, downloaded the photos, came in Monday morning, saw this screen. And they had to make a choice. 
pay thousands in ransom, or lose their clients' photos, wedding photos, irreplaceable, invaluable wedding photos. Tough choice. Now, what does this mean for you? How do you develop your cyber hygiene? How do you protect yourself? Well, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. There's no magic checklist I can give you today that you can follow and be secure. Cybersecurity is a dynamic, ongoing process that requires your active participation. But there are resources available, really good resources, that you can use to educate yourself, learn what you should be doing, what works for your systems, what works for your world, what works for you. But it is incumbent on you to take advantage of those resources, to use them, to develop your hygiene, to develop and secure yourself. Now, before I take my leave, I hope I was able to impart with you a few things about cyber warfare. The importance, complexity, and the urgency that we need you, our frontline defenders, to begin taking action, to begin defending yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, the resources are here. You are aware it is now incumbent on you to provide for the security, the well-being, and the protection of our new connected world. Thank you.